as worried about that are really the ones that are opening their doors. Um, the Community Health Center, when I left there four and a half years ago, had 100 patients on buprenorphine. Now today they have 400. Um, so they've increased their capacity dramatically. Not all community health centers have done that though. So there's still, I think, even pockets of the, the state where there's not great access um, into treatment. And the Chittenden Center in Burlington just reduced their wait list like just recently. Um, you know, it was not that long ago that it was months to a year long. So I think there's still lots of room to go as far as we still need more buprenorphine prescribers. And I think we still need low barrier buprenorphine. I, I, I would pl put a plug in for that because not everyone is ready or able to do the whole Chittenden Center Addiction Treatment Program, your office model of being clean and sober to everything, right? Like some people are still going to drink, some people are still going to smoke pot, some people are still going to occasionally use heroin. And you know, you and I would put our like thumbs down and say, well, you can't be using that if I'm prescribing. Um, but is there an argument for creating another pathway for people to get it, even if they don't want to be clean and sober? Well, um, we do, at least in our practice, we receive people from the hub. I don't know if that's what you do when they're stabilized. Mm -hmm. But do you envision then you know, people coming in just like an acute visit and getting a modest amount and then before they can get into the hub or maybe even in the ER, getting a certain amount and and having a system set up so I think the ER is you know. thinking about it here about um, getting some suboxone prescribers trained and um, then getting them to the hub from here um, what about syringe exchanges is there a use for a doc with a view license at places where people are exchanging their syringes maybe I think we definitely need to think a little bit more outside the box about some of this stuff because it's not meeting everyone's needs so, since you mentioned it, I think it's probably worth just clarifying that, that Dr. Pashkori and Dr. Greenberger and Dr. Swift are talking about the concept of um, immediate access to buprenorphine think through the ED or upon an admission to the hospital when someone might be in withdrawal danger. And um, I don't think anybody else is doing that around the state, so we'd be leading that experiment. But it's kind of exciting as long as the whole picture of treatment is there and the longitudinal mm -hmm. backup is in place mm -hmm. and we're working on that. Nicole? I think that would be great from an OE standpoint. It doesn't happen that often, but every now and then we get somebody who's coming out of the And it's very <coughs> difficult to, we have not a lot of experience with it. We call it UPM. They can only help us so much. Um, and it's extremely difficult to in that situation. So if we get something like that up and running, we also need So uh, a little uh, broader scale, just to come back to some of the early slides, it does, some of the early slides suggested that this isn't really just opiates, that all substances or use is really increasing in America. And the question is why? What's going on in America that's really making this happen? I mean, do you have some idea of why we are so addicted or still like to get high, as it were? I don't know. I mean, other industrialized I, I, I don't know when you get addicted to uh, yeah. benzodiazepines after Trump was elected. You did personally? <laughs> There's an interesting uh, YouTube video I saw around, I, I wish I could tell you what the guy's name was, but it was about um, this rat park, and he, he did in this experiment where they put rats in a cage with um, regular <laughs> water and heroin-laced water and that the rats would go back and forth to the heroin-laced water all the time once they discovered it and they became addicted and they would use the heroin-laced water. And then they were like, oh, well, you know, why is that? You know, these rats, but, you know, they're like, well, maybe they're not happy rats. Maybe their rats are just in this cage. And so they built like this rat park where they put, they had friends and they had things to do and places to go. And then they put the same like water bottles in the cage and there was, and the rats in rat park where they were happy rats, they never used the heroin-laced water. So, I don't know. There you go. We can create. <laughs> We're not happy rats. <laughs>
Do you have any great tricks for um, nerve-related pain syndromes? I'm an internist, and it's a difficult issue, the CRPS. We, have got a, you know, we all have yeah. interns have a fair number of that. Uh, of those patients are occipital neuralgia. And they're especially difficult pain syndromes. And right. you could just say, tell people, suck it up, so to speak, um, and you try the gabapentin they're right. on, the, you know, right. it doesn't work, Lyrica. Uh, um, and and they have trazodone, and they're left with, you know, pretty significant pain. You can't just say, do acupuncture is not always the magic Available thing. Any bright ideas on nerve-related pain syndromes aside from what we know? <laughs> yeah, the legacy patients who are on stuff. I just, you know, the, the only thing I would suggest is continuing that conversation with folks and continually looking at other ways to manage their pain and continually revisiting it as opposed to just having people on high dose opiates and maybe some amitriptyline or something and some neurotin and they're just on this path for the rest of their lives. I, I see quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if there's any, I don't know that I have any other tricks that you already know about you mm -hmm. know, those type of pain patients. but. Yeah, I don't know that marijuana or CBD is going to be our magic bullet either. There's certainly lots of folks that are that are moving towards that, and I feel like that is also going to create a whole other can of worms for us. Can you speak to or know anything about the, the implantable delivery device that they're using? There's a southern state, I don't know, I saw it in 60 Minutes or one of those shows, where they're implanting a device kind of like an Inflanon. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, it's buprenorphine. I think John Brooklyn's been using it a little bit at the Chittenden Center. I haven't used it. I think it lasts for two weeks or a month, but it stays in their system pretty long, but it's a similar type of thing. It's buprenorphine. It's every... Someone know? I haven't used it. I don't know. I think it... saw was more like a four to six month. Oh, yeah, like it. Yeah. And put it in the arm. I think John had said that he was having trouble getting insurance coverage for it because it's super expensive. Yeah. yeah, let's just put them in everybody, huh? That in, in one arm and the little birth control in the other arm. <laughs> 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 how, long, how long do you keep keeping people on buprenorphine uh, and uh, we'll see how it works. Anyway, I'll come up with it. I'll it's a great question. Um, I like to continually talk to folks about coming down on their dose. Um, rightfully, they are pretty scared about that usually because they remember how their lives were like before they got on the buprenorphine, and so that a lot of people are pretty reluctant to want to go back to that route. Um, I will say most people will probably be on some sort of buprenorphine probably for life. I have had the rare patient, though, that decided that they didn't want to be on anything anymore, and they either just stopped it or they worked with me to taper off. Um, so if they need to be on it for life, that yeah. means that if you have a practice of, of talking patients, when you retire, there has to be people to continue. Yeah, we've had the trouble around the state, right? When docs have left or retired or something happened with a prescriber that's got 100 patients, so the people have had to absorb them. Yeah. So that answers my second question, like what's, what's the long-term data for our success, or however you want to measure that? So it's a, it's a dependency for life. It is. Um, you have to build a lot of parks for the rats. <laughs> yeah. Called the job. You know, we don't have that expectation that the people are going to come off their antihypertensives or their insulin. You know, they're also dependent on those things for life. So if you're thinking of really thinking about it in the chronic disease model, um, I'm not sure that we should be expecting that people are coming off of these. You know, if they lose weight, they might come down on their dose. If they are eating less salt, they might come down on their hydrochlorothiazide. But, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that that is the correct expectation to have with these folks. But the, you can make the same argument with, with people who are on opioids and are functionally very active. Why, why is it bad to be 80 years old and be on an opioid and be a happy person and functional and you've been, been doing it for 30 years? Why is that different than buprenorphine? Because of the risk it puts them at. Excuse me? The, the risk with opiates is much higher than the risk with buprenorphine at So 80. what's the risk of someone who's been on a drug for 30 years and never had a single medical complication from it? Um, <laughs> I would argue that just because they've never had a complication doesn't mean they won't ever have a complication. And I think it's again looking at the risks and benefits and the dose and what else are they on and what other what other chronic medical problems do they have. 
Um, I think the status quo with how we're prescribing opiates is not where we want to be. I'm not in yeah. any way implying everyone should be on opioids, yeah. but there are subsets of people, it seems to me, that, that do very well on them. And I don't see ethically why that's less I don't think you're taking everybody off. Else. I don't think you're taking everybody off, but I think we are having a reassessment of everybody that should be on them, um, of their dose and other risks, for sure. But those that you're truly the rat thing, I mean, if their life has changed, and you know, go back to the rats, but you know, the life has changed and yeah. the quality of life has improved and yeah. been on view for four years, yeah. say, and maybe they would be ones to come on because yeah. the social circumstances, yeah. I mean, so. The, and that's who comes off of them. You know, I've seen women deliver their babies and then they're very stable and happy and they have a good partner and jobs and they're like, yeah, I'm done with this and come off of it. It, it, it has happened. Well, I would argue, Peter, that with the Suboxone, it's not, we're not just giving them a pill. I mean, there's therapy, there's counseling, and a lot of other things involved. True. And I have chronic pain people like you do, and I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that is pain and how much are they just addicted to the medicine, and we're just, you know, and, and yeah, they're <coughs> doing okay, but I think it probably is healthier to have a more comprehensive approach. And so our Suboxone people are seeing a therapist mm -hmm. or, or a psychiatrist in addition to just coming in to see us. So. I would love to have that comprehensive approach with all of our chronic conditions, right? With you have your diabetes person, your hypertension person, yeah. started to do is, um, I'm a family practice physician, so I get lots of pre-op consults, and I work at an integrative medical center, so we've done a fellowship. And so, you know, you get your pre-op consult, someone who's relatively healthy, so you have a little bit extra time. And I talk to them about possibly doing, like, um, guided imagery or hypnosis before. There are a lot of studies from the UK, and they routinely use it prior to surgery um, and afterwards. And they've shown that they've decreased the number of pain medicines they, they've needed, their outcomes are improved, their mm -hmm. hospital stays are shorter. And coming from someone at a, like a sort of standard medical clinic, people are like, oh, I never even thought about mm -hmm. that, and maybe I'll try that. I don't know if any of my orthopedic colleagues have had anyone say that they've seen Dr. Carlson and she's recommended that, but I've been doing that almost routinely now with all my pre-op consults because you know, in hopes that maybe we'll have less opiates right. That's being amazing. passed out. And um, there are, you know, you can buy guided imagery things, but there's so many free ones through different universities. So I have a couple that I just have in a bookmark and I print it out for the patient and they can do it on their own for free. And I tell them to bring it to the, the service <coughs> to their hospital room and listen to it before and then bring it and listen to it after. There's um, also a lot of free apps in that domain as well. And I tell them, well, if you don't believe in this, fine, but it's free, and uh -huh. it'll take a few minutes of your time for a week before. Try it. It's not so, going to hurt you. No. Mm -hmm. That's great. You've got to get everybody coming to you for a pre-op consult now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what the support, if 
any will be around those uh, injections sites where people can come and it be safe for them to use their heroin? What the thought is in the state for that, or what your thoughts are, or is that something like the medical society to get behind? Is that something that I don't know? We'll see. There's yeah. What'd you say? The governor has taken his position. Yeah, yeah. There's a, uh, a there's hearings tomorrow morning with the in the in Montpelier about there's a bill on the table about this. Um, there's one operating in Vancouver. There's a couple that just popped up in Mon uh, Montreal recently. And they have nurses on site, and they have kind of private. The one in Vancouver has private injection rooms. Uh, people bring their own drugs. They're monitored for a certain amount of time afterwards to make sure that they look okay, and then they're released. Um, but they have nurses that are on site. Um, they also have, like, so they're in a building where they off also offer people treatment services. So they have, you know, if you want treatment, you can go up to the second floor and, and obtain treatment there. And they also have um, a shelter, like a uh, like a homeless shelter in the same building. So they do try to provide some, some comprehensive care. They have a primary care provider that's there on a regular basis as well, and, and they try to provide some services, um, primary care services as well. So, um, you know, I don't know what would be developed of anything here, but there's a discussion about it. Yeah, um, so, John and Mashkuri and I have been meeting with um, a lot of the medication and assisted treatment folks in, uh, in, in Vermont. We have a big meeting in January. Uh, one of the things that we're considering doing is starting buprenorphine in the hospital for a selected population and then transitioning them to the, you know, to a community provider. Mm -hmm. um, one of the really exciting ones would be for the for that person to come into the hospital and do a consult prior to them going, so we yeah. have like a really warm yeah. handoff. Hand mm -hmm. yeah. um, you you guys have been doing that at UVM, haven't you? Some some yep. They do a, a Sanjit Marudi's team uh, well, from the addiction treatment program are the ones who come and does a consult. It used to be John Brooklyn from the Hub who would be kind of doing these one offs, and then he would take people into the Chittenden Center. But once the addiction treatment program was stood up, um, Sanjit or his colleagues now do a you know, psychiatry, do they do a consult. And they also have this psychology uh, med psych team. So the psychologists also do a consult and will kind of start the therapeutic treatment while someone's in the hospital. Um, and then the patients, when they're discharged from the hospital, they'll follow up at ATP first and do their six weeks or so of programming there before they're released to the primary care clinics. Uh, but yeah, but finding a primary care provider has to happen before they leave and because um, they need to make sure there's a prescriber on the other end of the, the ATP. Yeah, fairly recent though. Not been doing that for very long. Mm -hmm. It's great because, you know, people used to just be, you know, they'd spend six weeks to eight weeks for, you know, bone infections or heart valve endocarditis and then we would just release them back out to the streets just to continue their IV drug use because there was no spokes willing to take them and no, you know, no room at the hub. Mm -hmm. So that has opened up dramatically even in the past year. Yeah. Diversion drives me a little crazy. Um, <laughs> and what everybody else. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you have much of a problem with diversion of buprenorphine or give a good system in place to minimize that because it's just so darn irritating when you see it happen. Um, I don't know, do you have any bright ideas about that? You know, I mean, John Brooklyn would say, well, you know, at least the, 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 the people or the addicts on the street who can't get access to view, but they're getting it that way at least, you know. So mm -hmm. all diversion is not necessarily bad. Hmm. Um, you know, I think lots of people, I don't know about lots, but there are certainly people who take buprenorphine who are on 16 milligrams a day and they might take one 8 milligram strip and they sell the other one for 20 bucks or whatever they're selling it for. Um, I don't know of a great solution for it. You know, I do try to keep people on the strips and they're numbered. Not all the pharmacies keep track of the numbers on the strips and then calling people in and if you can actually verify that they've got the strips that they were, they were given. Um, I've had, you know, I do have patients bring their empty packets in with them um, and so if you really wanted to verify that that's what the pharmacy that gave them you can um,
but you know, just trying to keep them on short prescriptions and regular follow up and yeah, I don't know of a good solution to that, but I think there are a lot of people who take one and sell one. I've definitely heard that. Yeah.